the Savior who helps, loves us, who made us, who sustains us, is really an amazing thing. So um, let's go ahead and get started in with a good a word of prayer real fast. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for these songs of worship that remind us of who you are, uh, that you're God of great and infinite grace, uh, that it's enough for our deepest, darkest sins, Lord, to forgive them and to make us right with you. God, we thank you for um, the passages of Scripture, Lord, that, that remind us that you are a God who forgives sins. Um, even in Exodus, how it says you don't let the guilty go unpunished, Lord. There's a tension there that says you're a loving, forgiving God, but you don't let guilt go unpunished, and yet you figured out the way. You, you did the by, uh, by giving us Jesus, Lord. And I'm getting ahead of ourselves, but we just want to thank you for um, just the great gift of grace that you have given us. I pray that this morning, Lord, we would um, appreciate it. We would appreciate that we can come to you um, for grace in our moment of need. Um, we can confess our sins to you, Lord. I pray that you would help us this morning and help us to listen and help me to be clear in, in communicating your word this morning now. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. So this morning, again, welcome. It's great to see you all. It's great to be opening God's Word um, and talking about prayer. And just one last, another reminder. Again, we last week was a great uh, tryout run. We're leaving the front rows empty at the end of the service, and I'm not doing the meet and greet at the end. Not because I don't want to meet and greet you guys, but just because I uh, um, want to give space for prayer at church. And so... Um, I appreciated the, <clears throat> the response that, that people felt ne need to. It's not, we're not doing altar calls and things, but again, it's that thing. We want to invite people at the end of service. If you feel like something spoke to you or God spoke to you or you need to just talk to him at the end of service before you get to lunch or be out to other conversations, um, the front rows are, are open for that at the end of, of church. And I'll just be praying from here at the end of the service as well. Um, we are talking about prayer. We're trying about getting prayer right and the challenge of prayer as a church, um, the great privilege we have to pray. And so, again, reminding, i got to keep going back to the, the basics and, and the reminders because it isn't helpful to recap that. Um, the most important thing that I can remember and say is that prayer is possible because of Jesus' redeeming work, right? Be, making his children. It's such an important thing that he... If we don't have God's redeeming work, if Jesus didn't come and die to make, bridge the gap between men and women, or not men and women, men, mankind and him, uh, prayer would just be speaking to ourselves. And yet, he made it possible through God's, through Christ's redeeming work. Um, and so, that's such an important thing. We've talked a little bit, and we're going to remind ourselves that the primary goal of prayer is not getting things from God, but really to know Him, to know God, to, to build relationship with Him. Um, for a couple of weeks, we talked about Jesus' prayer life, and specifically the example that He set, that He showed us, was that we can pray expectantly in all situations. We can pray at any time. Jesus did that, and so we can do that as well. And He said, look, pray expecting God to move and to work. And so that's awesome. That's just really good to see. Um, now we're talking for the next three weeks in a row, right? We lacked last week about upward prayer, three essential prayers. And the essentials of prayer, I've simplified them um, to an upward prayer of praise and thanksgiving, an inward-focused prayer of confession, and then outward-focused outward focused on petition, praying for others. Praying for God to do things. And so last week we talked about the upward prayer of praise. And I think we need to even remind ourselves of that again. That praise is the essential first prayer. It is really the right response if we, are to, if we grasp God's greatness. Okay, It's an appropriate sense of, of just awe and wonder. If we see God, if we see him in his power, in his infinite knowledge, in his holiness, it will really cause us <laughs> to praise and, and to thank him for that. 
And so really that praise is giving him credit that he's due. And in the Lord's Prayer that we kind of use as a part of the foundation there, the Lord's Prayer, that's that first line that says, Our Father in heaven, right? hallowed be your name. Um, hallowed be your name. Holy is his name. And so hopefully as we look at God's character, we need to look and know that God's character leads us to awe and wonder at his greatness. And then that ties to thanksgiving. So even praise and thanksgiving, sometimes some of us might think of the acts when we think about prayer, the prayers of acts, A-C-T-S, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. That's a good model. I've kind of cheated and, and put them together, right? A and T together into praise because I think it's really important to think about. And as I'm still even rem- processing in myself, as we talk about praise, it can be, I want to give a tip, really, as we're thinking about praise, because thanksgiving is really a good way to get our minds into adoration. Has anyone ever prayed and say, you know what, adoration, praising God is a really important part of prayer. And yet, sometimes it's hard to just start your prayer saying, God, you're amazing. God, you are holy. Um, God, you do amazing, right? You're, you're glorious. You're awesome. Sometimes that's a difficult thing to even start with. So a tip that I have that I think I've been using with our kids really is to start with thanksgiving. Thank you, God, for blank. Thank you, God, that you are. And you start the thankfulness part. It kind of can get your mindset into the, oh, yeah, he is amazing. He is awesome. And so that's just something that I was thinking about a little bit this week, thinking, you know what? Thanksgiving is, that's why they go together. Thanksgiving, if we recognize him, it actually helps us to recognize him. We start by thanking him. And so um, with that, the right perspective, again, seeing that God is holy, he's righteous, he's perfect. um, He's the creator, sustainer of the entire universe, including our lives, um, If we start with that, that upward essential prayer, it rightfully, I think, leads to an inward focus. It leads us to kind of think inwardly and say, what do I do about that? Um, A passage that I think demonstrates this well, praise points us to self-reflection. That's one of the first ideas I want to talk about. Praise points us to self-reflection because it's kind of like this. What do I do about it when I see God. And Psalm 8, there's a really good example of it. Psalm 8 is um, David marveling at God's work. So he starts with prayer, but then it, it turns inward. It gets him thinking about even himself. And so I want to read that one just as a starting point of what happens when we are praising, and giving God the glory he's due, what that does. And so Psalm 8 starts it and says this. He says, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of infants and children, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, right? He's thinking about it. What's his next thought? What is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. Okay? So when David considers God's great handiwork, this great glory, his great, you know, the heavens, the, the, just these amazing celestial beings and things that, that make you feel small, right? He says it brings him back to humanity and says, wow, how do you even care and Think about people. What is man that you even are mindful of us? Um, And if we think about it, that's a great question. What is man that God is mindful of us? Uh, That self-reflection, I think if we think too much about it, some of us don't want to think so much about it because it leads to a sober recognition. Man, look at God's greatness, his amazing things. Once you see that, the sobering realization is your own unworthiness, right? your own smallness. <clears throat> it's similar to the passage we, we looked at last week in Isaiah, Isaiah 6, 5, right? 
when Isaiah saw God's holiness, his greatness, his perfection, the response he had was, what was it? Woe is me. Woe is me. I'm ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. And I've seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Okay? So really, an appropriate response to God's infinite glory and holiness is a self-reflection that, that is concerning, right? That says, whoa, I am not where he is. Okay? <clears throat> so the good news is, as we reflect, as we see God's greatness, and as it points to our not-greatness, the good news is that God is not just infinitely above and beyond us. Um, the beauty of God is that he also offers relationship. Um, it's an amazing thing. And so we're going to talk today about how that can be that God offers relationship to sinful people. Um, and we're going to talk about the prayer of the essential prayer of confession because this is an inward focus. When we look at God's greatness, it makes us think about what's going on in our own lives. And the essential thing to do is to bring what's going on in our lives to God himself. And the best starting point is confession and repentance. Okay? It's a short piece of the Lord's Prayer, but I think it's really important. It's really critical. And that piece of the prayer is, right, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Um, so, again, my goal today, I just want to... Be clear, my goal today is to instill in us the importance and necessity of confession. To say confession is an essential prayer. It is, it is, is not right up there with adoration and, and worship, praise, but it comes right after praising God. Our response needs to be confession. So just even as we start, some of us might think about confession in different ways. Some of us in different um, Christian backgrounds or upbringings have an idea of confession being something we do where we uh, go to a closet yeah. and share with a guy and, and he tells, right, your deepest, darkest secrets. Um, and then he says he'll pray for you or you then make a penance of that sort, right? But I want to start by defining terms because sometimes confession, we can think of sayings, right? There's a saying, I was thinking about this, I'm like, I think this is my own. Confession is good for the soul. Has anybody heard that? Okay, that's not just one that I made up. I think it's Scottish, but I think even that one is a, uh, is a confession amongst friends. It's like, hey, keeping short tabs with each other, like confessing, admitting that you're wrong and stuff. That's good for the soul. It clears your, keeps short tabs. And that's a nice thought, but more important is we're talking confession to the Lord. Confession and repentance. So defining terms. And I'll define it in this way. Confession is the simplest form, is admitting wrong and asking for forgiveness. Okay? Admitting wrong, asking forgiveness. It's closely tied to repentance. In, in Scripture, the two go together because um, repentance, a little different, is this willful turning away from a wrong. So you repent, you're turning away from the wrong thing, turning away from it. But involved in that is, is admitting the wrong thing, right? Confession and repentance go hand in hand. Recognizing sin, admitting it, asking forgiveness, turning away from it. Okay? All these things go together, and those, that's the broad general term, um, defining term that I'm going to do. Okay? And so this is why confession is essential. And, and so it's an essential prayer because... Confession plays really a vital role in starting a relationship with God. Um, my first point is it's saving faith, be having and beginning a relationship with God involves confession and repentance. It is, it is a really big part of that. That's a big deal. Um, Jesus' words to his disciples after, his res after Jesus' resurrection emphasize the need for repentance. When he said, look, my raising from the dead, this message, this good news of my life, my, my going forth, my humanity being restored in relationship with God, 
Um, repentance is a part of that. And so Luke 24, 45 is the passage that talks about that. And it says this, right? This is after he shows himself to them, after they've met him, after they're amazed by his teaching them. And he's saying, look, as you're going to go out, he says, then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Okay, so this message of Jesus' resurrection, that his resurrection is the pivotal point of history, right? that Jesus' death and resurrection paid the price of sin, makes people right with God. Part of that is that people will repent, recognize their sin and need for Jesus' salvation. Um, Peter's sermon at Pentecost also emphasized repentance from sin. Uh, in Acts 2.36, as he's talking about Jesus and what Jesus did and about Jesus being the Messiah, the promised one of God, he says, uh, Acts 2.36, he says, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, who you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Right? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That was the first gospel, right? Missionary preaching gospel message was repent, right? They believed. They believed. The next piece was, what do we do that we believe that Jesus is Messiah? He is, right, the Lord of the universe, they said, repent, turn, confess your sin in the name of Jesus, be forgiven, okay? So, confession is a huge part of that. Now, you might say, and you might have heard even in, in, in a gospel presentation, hold on a second, um, salvation, to be a Christian, all it means, right? I thought the only thing that's needed is what? Believe. Right? Believe and receive. And so um, passages like this kind of question uh, make me think about that. So like, am I adding, I'm not trying to add anything to the simple gospel of believe and receive Jesus' gift. But the question is, I think, what are we believing Jesus for? Okay? What are we believing Jesus for? Because a lot of people say, I believe in Jesus. I believe Jesus died. I believe Jesus came back alive. That's great, right? But the piece that is incredibly important that's necessary, the belief in Jesus is believing in his atoning work, that his death, his resurrection, what he did by living a sinless life and dying paid the penalty for sin. So if we don't recognize that we're the ones he died for, that each of us, rightfully deserves right rightfully deserves his judgment because we've sinned then believing is, is it's just believing that there was this guy that's not saving faith that the saving faith confession recognizing that our relationship with god is irreparably broken because of our sin is is why confession is so important god is holy we are sinful that's what we need to recognize and knowing that those can't go together, that we're born in sin, um, we need to recognize that part in, in our starting our relationship with God, in believing and for his gift to apply to us. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, so recognition and confession of sin is critical in the initial receiving of God's free gift of salvation. Um, so many passages of scripture are there of Romans 5, 6. Critical to the gospel message is this truth that sin, our sin, separates us from holy God. Okay, and so when we recognize that, the first step is recognizing it and confessing it and saying, admitting it, 
Um, Romans 5, 6 is one of those. And these are great verses just to remind ourselves of God's goodness in the gospel. Romans 5, 6 says, You see, at just the right time, while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Right? 5, 6. Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 15, 3, another beautiful one. It says, For I, what I received I passed on to you as of first importance. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Okay? Galatians 2, I did not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Okay? So the, the reason Christ died wasn't, it wasn't just to be... Um, wasn't just to show injustice in the world. wasn't just to be thoughtful or show, you know, that he was a nice guy or anything. His death was for righteousness, to make unrighteous, sinful people righteous. Um, and so it shows us, it tells us that sin is our problem. Sin is the issue. Jesus had to give his life for in order for God to forgive. It's as our response. If you've never received that, if, if, if your understanding of the gospel is just like Jesus did a great thing and I like him and I want to just act like him, I want to just follow him in example, you're missing the gospel. Because the gospel is that we are dead in sin and that his death makes us alive. It pays that penalty that we deserve. Um, and so recognizing that we deserve that is the starting point for receiving salvation. Okay, so that's where confession is so important. It's essential in our receiving of salvation. So if you've never even considered that, if you've never thought about that, if, if your understanding of the gospel is just, you know, Jesus did good things, he lived a perfect life so I can follow his example, look back and say, recognize our sin is what put it there. Our sin is the, is the issue. And so um, confession is essential in that in that belief. So that's one of the reasons confession is an essential prayer. It's, it really is what starts us into relationship with God. But secondly, um, confession doesn't stop once you get saved. Okay? Um, the second point I want to make is that confession is essential, not just in salvation, but in sanctification. You guys know these words. These are big Bible words. But uh, salvation is the initial saving that God gives us. Sanctification is the growing to be like Christ, to growing to be like Jesus once he has saved you. And confession is an essential part of sanctification. There is a need for confession for believers. Um, maybe you don't want to hear that. Maybe as a Christian you said, I got saved, I confessed my sins to God, and now... I'm just going to walk in holiness and be perfect from here on out. God forgave every sin that I sinned and ever will sin, so I don't have to ever think about sin again. What do you think? Is anybody in that position where you stopped sinning completely once you got saved? Um, if so, talk to me because i got to point out that's not true. Okay? Sadly, until we get to heaven, each one of us will still sin now, again, the truth is God did forgive every sin that you did and every sin that you will do. On the cross, that's it. Um, we do not need to earn one bit of anything more. However, confession is needed to grow in our relationship with Christ. Um, it is a practice that the early believers showed as they grew in faith. And so it's something that we should pay attention to as well. Uh, Acts 19, 18 talks about this. It talks about the power that God was showing through the disciples, through the apostles. Um, and it, uh, Acts 19, 18, one of the things it says, it says, The name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. And these were things, a number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. People were starting to see 
the apostles see the message of the gods of, of Christ's power through them, through his resurrection, and saying, wow, this is something. People were believing, and they were saying, hold on a second. I need to confess the sins and the things that I'm stuck in that I'm doing wrong. Um, and they started to believe the gospel. The first signs of their growth in faith, their growth in trust in Christ, was that they were confessing the wrong things that they were a part of and giving them up together. That was a huge thing. Um, also, confession, as we go into this passage, um, <clears throat> it's prescribed for believers. Okay? It's prescribed as an important way that Christians grow in Christ-likeness. Um, 1 John 1, 9 is probably one of my favorite promises that God makes. Um, and it's, I think it's for both those who need to confess, believe in Jesus for the first time, and it's true for those who are his, his church, who have already received grace. And what it says is this. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay? To grow in Christ-likeness is to grow more like him, right? To become more like Jesus, to be more righteous. Now, again, God has, on the cross, through Jesus' saving work, he has made us completely right in standing before God. Right? He, conf- he forgives every sin, and so God sees us, and he sees Jesus' righteousness placed on us. Our life after that is where we can still either become more like Jesus or we can live as baby Christians as sadly, right, as continuing in sin. And Jesus says, look, if you confess sins, God is faithful, he's just, he will forgive those sins and he will cleanse us from unrighteousness. Being cleansed is a huge blessing for believers. Believers should continue to confess sins because, guess what? Believers will still sin. And to keep that a secret or to deny that we sin or to um, wallow in sin, just the, none of those things is a good thing. Okay? Um, we're encouraged as Christians to continue confessing sins. And it's a big miss if we don't. There's a benefit to confessing sins to one another and to God. James 5.16 even says so. It says, confess your sins to each other and pray for others that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Right? He says, confess your sins to each other. Pray for one another, confessing to each other. It's, it's an amazing benefit that the church can have to confess sins might not think about it, might think, no, 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 let's just keep it, keep it on the surface level, right? Pretend we're all good, glory that God has, has, has saved us, and just leave it at that, right? And yet, we miss so much if, we're, if we do that. Um, as I was thinking about this a little bit, I, I was noticed there's, there's kind of two mistakes that Christians can make regarding confession when we think about sin. And, and it's one of those things of missing out as a body of Christians, Okay, there's two errors that can happen pretty easily in the Christians and church folk. And so that's why I want to talk about them for just a minute. Um, so I kind of mentioned it. Some, when they become Christians, after asking God to forgive them once, they go on their way and think, okay, that's great. Never think about sin again. I got saved. Everything was forgiven. I'm not going to worry about sin again. Okay? And so even as a Christian, they have no conviction of sin. That's a problem, okay? Others might recognize that they're still sinning even after they believe in Jesus, right? And they say, oh no, this is bad. I'm, I thought I was saved. I thought I was going to be done with that, right? And so they, they still struggle with sin and they suffer from despair, okay? And they recognize, look, this is bad to continue sinning. They're convicted, but they make the other mistake of in, but instead of confessing to sin, you know, confessing that to God, resting in his forgiveness, they avoid talking about sin. They try and hide it. They think, wait, hold on. If I confess again, like maybe I'm going to, I don't want to 
Maybe I didn't do it right the first time, right? So they keep sin hidden, and instead are torn, just um, shame and guilt is how they're just living in that, right? So the first problem is the guy who says, look, I'm gonna, I got saved, and I'm, I've never sinned again, right? Even though they are still sinning, right? The other person is feeling no relief from sin because they're not confessing it and receiving and recognizing that God is ready to forgive. Okay, so both are missing out on God's plan of sanctification. God's plan for sanctification is that we grow in obedience to him. And so, right, no one will fully be completely free of sin while we live on earth. But as the Holy Spirit convicts us, right, he will remind us that our new identity is as God's children. And so the person who says, look, I'll never have to sin again, hopefully will start being convicted of sin and saying, oh, no, I'm putting my own righteousness in here. I'm not, that's not the right thing to do. I need to confess sin. I need to admit that I do things wrong. The other person who's wallowing and, and, and just by shame and guilt needs to say, look, hold on. You know what? I can recognize if I confess God's sin, he will forgive me. Even if I sin again and mess up again, he'll forgive again. He is continually doing that. As God's children, it leads to conviction, right? It leads to repentance and, and forgiveness. And again, we can be in this place, instead of avoiding sin or being secret about it or pretending it doesn't happen, instead, being just reminded of God's forgiveness, his amazing grace that he continually pours out on us. And that's much better than those other two options, okay? Um, to fail to confess sins is to fail in growing in our relationship with God, okay? To confess sins is to, then you get to receive the clear conscience, right? There's, there's a great opportunity to better experience God's grace and forgiveness. We don't want to miss that by avoiding or not confessing, okay? So confession is a critical, essential in our salvation. It's critical, essential in sanctification. And then the third point, I wasn't even sure how to put this, but those are the two points, but I just wanted to say there's benefits to confession, okay? I mentioned it there in that one that it's part of sanctification in terms of recognizing God's grace. But I think there's more in terms of benefits to a congregation, to a church body, to individuals in that body um, to grow in your relationship with Jesus. Um, so I know it's not popular. Nobody thinks it's fun to uh, confess our weaknesses, our failures, our sins, right? Um, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing to do that with God himself. It's really hard to do that with other sinful people, right? To trust them to say, you're not going to use that against me. You're not going to, you're going to forgive me if I confess a sin as well, right? <clears throat> but confession is strongly recommended as a lifestyle for Christians, a lifestyle of confession. And it does show benefits to those who are marked by it. Um, I'm going to just go through a few of them as I saw them. Uh, that passage on James, James 5, I think recommends it again. It says 516, he says, the prayer offered in faith will make a sick person well. He talks about prayer for healing, right? It says, the Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. So confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. There's something to this verse that says, look, if you are holding unconfessed sin, your, sin, your, your prayers are not as effective. So confess your sins. Be clear with God to be the righteous person he wants you to be. There will be more effectiveness, more power in your prayer. That's a pretty neat thing to see, healing, unhindered prayer um, through confession. Um, tied to that also, uh, Matthew 5 talks about it. It says in verse 23, he talks about if you're offering your gift at the altar, right? If you're trying to worship God, gift to the altar, and remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift in front of the altar, go and be reconciled to them, then come and, and offer your gift. What would it mean if you have a brother who has something against you, right? Stop 
don't worship yet, go and what would you be doing? Confessing, right? Confessing wrong, asking forgiveness, then come and offer your gift. It shows that right? God's, how do I even put this? God's gift of grace is something that we should be demonstrating with others. So if you've received his grace, we should be giving it as well. Um, another of the benefits would be the clean conscience. A, a clean conscience is a great benefit to confession. Okay? Uh, that first passage we read in Psalms where David says, look, I wasted away when I held on to my sin. Right? I kept it secret and it, it tore it. And my body wasted away. It's, it's not helpful. And so to confess sins, to get right with God daily, to say, God, I have sinned against you. I've sinned against my friends. I've sinned against your body. I want to apologize. I want you to forgive me. Please do so. Knowing that he does that gives a clean conscience. And that's a huge important thing to say. Um, the third would be a lifestyle of honesty. Ephesians 4, 25, people of, being, people of integrity that says, Ephesians 4, 25 says, having put away falsehood, let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Right? Lack of confession is just kind of a dishonest way of living, right? It's like, I'm going to keep my secrets, I'm going to keep my sins hidden. And he says, look, put away falsehood. Be honest. Be honest about your failings. We're members of one another in the body. That's something we can help with. Right? You can encourage one another to obedience. So there's a huge benefit to that. Um, there's mutual edification, building one another up. Um, one of the huge ones is that forgiveness amongst the body can happen with confession. Conversely, forgiveness is hindered if there's not confession. If we think about this, <clears throat> Ephesians 4 says, look, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as in Christ God forgave you. So the idea is that God forgave us. We can then demonstrate that. We can show the world how God forgave us by being people who forgive one another, right? How do you forgive one another if you never admit wrong to one another? <laughs> It'd be great to say, go around and just say, like, oh, I'm going to go forgiving people. I'm like, hey, I forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive you. What for? <laughs> right? What for? Why would I do that? Well, then, it's, then it becomes a, a, it gets flipped on. It says it's not helpful. So you're like, hey, I forgive you. What for? Oh, you're, <laughs> I, I don't like you. You do this wrong to me. Right? Confession is necessary to say, hey, you know what? I admit I did something wrong to you. Would you forgive me? And then the person says, yes, I recognize that wrong. Yes, I forgive you. Because guess what? God forgave me. Okay? So that verse that Ephesians 4, it's this presupposition that confession is happening. Okay? I don't think you can forgive sins that others have admitted, have not admitted to, have not confessed. You can you can say you've forgiven them, you, but there's not actual reconciliation there without both sides doing it, right? Admitting and asking forgiveness. And so when we do confess wrong, it gives us that great model that a healthy church should do. And so, again, those who receive God's grace, what they do is demonstrate grace. It's an amazing thing. So I know confession is not a popular thing. I think it's, it's a difficult thing. It's a hard thing to get with one another, right? And yet, <clears throat> we'd rather just ignore that, right? Ignore this uncomfortable acknowledgement of sin. We want to avoid judgment from each other. And yet, the Bible clearly talks about confession, admitting sin, uh, asking for forgiveness, turning away from it. These things are important. It is necessary work for Christians. It is necessary in our salvation to start a relationship with God, and it's necessary as we build and grow in our relationship with God. So it's right to confess sin and to deal with sin. Um, 
just as a final thing, Christians should not pretend they don't sin. Instead, we should be more sensitive to sin, quicker to confess. And why is that? Why, is the, why should we do that? It's because God's grace has been poured out on us so generously. To not confess, to not admit sin, we don't want to cheat <laughs> cheat that grace. It's poured out so great to, to not receive it fully. Is a, it's really cheating ourselves. And so um, it's an utterly unique thing to have God's grace. Um, let's not stifle it by not confessing. Let's confess sins to another. And just, again, reminding ourselves of 1 John 1, 9, knowing, remembering, he is faithful and just to forgive all our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, that's my, my encouragement for us this morning. Let's be people who confess sin, knowing God forgives freely. Let's pray, and then we'll sing one more song, just confessing our need for him. Heavenly Father, we just...